this morning. As was echoed earlier, it's so good to see us trickling back in together. It's, it's a beautiful thing. God is good. And he will, he will give us what we need when we need it. I'm glad our God is a patient God. That he allowed us to go through those thoughts in our minds and our heads. He continues to watch over us until we make that step. And I'm just so appreciative of him always. Every day of the week, we are so thankful to God for him being the authority figure. For him being the one that turns the days, the nights, that brings the sunshine, brings the rain. That he's in charge of everything. And we are just so glad to have him on our side. And for us to be on his side. And we're just so grateful to God for all of those. We continue to offer prayers this morning for all our members here and abroad who continue to fight the good fight of faith. Uh, continue to pray for Sister Vanessa Thomas this morning. She had to stop by the ER. So she wasn't feeling good this morning. So continue to pray for her. And I know Brother Upshaw, he's out there driving a the truck today. And I talked to him over the phone for a little while. I sent a little text message to him and Tell him we keep him in our prayers, our new brother in Christ. They continue to pray for him and his family uh, during this time period. I just love the connection that we have here. And uh, I thank God for Brother Billingsley who, who gave me what I needed. And I was just jumping for joy when he gave it to me. So I'm just so thankful to him also and his wife and to all the members here at South Park. I just thank God for our unity that we have in spirit and for the love that we tend to show one another. This week has been a, a rough week for, you want to say, society or America at whole. Again, on a few days ago, uh, one of the great uh, civil rights activists, uh, John Lewis, uh, passed away. Uh, I happened to watch a video where a 10-year-old girl did an interview with him. And he asked if he could, she asked if she could do it. And they didn't reveal to him who it was until late in the day. He recognized the young girl. And she said, she showed a picture of him in his younger life. When he was walking across, I guess the bridge going to Selma, Alabama. Called it Bloody Monday, they call it. And she said, when you see this photo, what comes to mind? And he teared up. And she, he began to explain to her uh, that photo picture and said how when we came, got ready to cross the bridge, they told us that the march stopped here. You could not continue to cross this bridge. Return back to the church you came from and everything would be all right. And they merely asked one question. They understood what was happening. They said, but is it okay if we turn around and just kneel for prayer? And by the time they turned around and kneeled for prayer, he said, all he remember hearing was the order given to the police officers to charge, to go forward, to do whatever they had in their mind to do. And they rushed him and they beat him with clubs down to the ground. His friend, uh, activist with him, uh, lost his life. John said he woke up and he had been beaten. He said, I didn't know what to make of it. He said, I don't even know how I got back to the church. I don't know if somebody carried me back or what, but I don't remember. He said, but a little while later, I was in the hospital trying to recover from what had just happened. She said, oh, you're a hero. He said, no, I don't call myself a hero. He said, I just believe that somewhere in the history and in time, I was just destined to be where I was and to do exactly what I did. She said, yeah, but she said, you're amazing to go through all of that. He said, I don't know if you call me amazing, a hero, or any of those great terms. He said, all I know is something was wrong that needed to be made right. And I was just chosen to be in that place. He got done. He said, yeah. She said, well, I got one more thing to ask you. He said, what's that? She said, can I get up and give you a hug? He said, sure you can. Got up and gave her a hug. And that kind of moved me to a passage of scripture this morning that I want us to look at. 
I want us to, I, sometimes you got to have a little Bible class sometimes. Then I write sometimes. I want to look, I want to, 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 to know something. Everybody in this building, if you are a child of God today, there is a purpose for your life. There is a plan for your life. If you are called by God, I'm afraid sometimes this pandemic and virus and adversities and, 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 and civil, uh, uh, civil unrestness and all these things, sometimes they deter us from our purpose. Sometimes the devil just throws stuff out there just to throw it out there to keep you from continuing on the road that you was on. And if you're not in Christ, you won't see it. You will start to follow where adversity is. You will start looking for trouble. And believe it or not, trouble will find you. Oh, yes, it will. Trouble will come in your house, put his feet up on your chair, and tell you I'm in charge today. And trouble will tell you when it's going to leave if we're not careful. We get too wrapped up in stuff, and we forget about our creator. And just for a little while today, Ephesians chapter 2, three verses. Ephesians chapter 2. I hope you have your Bibles or your iPads or your iPhones or, or just your eyes this morning. Just, I'm so glad my brother echoed the idea this morning about uh, taking the communion cups and just drop them in the trash on your way out. That was a good thing. We don't, we're not going to reuse those. I know we grew up in an era where their grandma chewed the food and put it in your mouth and you just swallow. But we ain't going to do that no more. We ain't going to do that no more. We're going to be a little bit more sanitary than that right now, church. But Ephesians chapter 2, begin at verse number 8, 9, and 10. The Bible says, for by grace... Are ye saved through faith? And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Yes, sir. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. Unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. I'm, I'm, I'm going to slow it down this morning. I, 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 I want to stay here for a few Sundays, it's okay. I, I, I want to deal with this workmanship thing that we are God's workmanship. You may have read this before but I'm going to read verse 10 to you again. Look how he breaks this. He leaves nothing to our thoughts. He leaves nothing to what we want to do. He leaves nothing to how we're going to do it. It's all coming from one source, and that's from God. Because we are his workmanship. You don't decide nothing for your life when you take Christ as your life. He becomes the guiding authority in your life. Every time you move, you consult him. When you're about to make a decision, you consult him. And if the words say don't do it, don't you do it. Why? Because you are his workmanship. Understand something. You're not the only one watching you. Christians are watching Christians. Sinners are watching Christians. Everybody's watching everybody. The watchees got somebody watching them too. You walk inside the store and say, well, the man on the camera was watching you and saw you steal something. Well, guess what? It's another man on another camera watching him watching you. Everybody's being watched around this time period. But look at verse number 10 again. It says, for we, that's us, are his, his workmanship. We turn out to be something based upon what he has done. Created in Christ Jesus. That's where it got done at. In Christ Jesus. Unto good works. 
What works? Which God has before ordained. And what are we going to do with them? That you should do what? Walk in them. He's already specified the works that are pleasing to him and how you ought to walk. It's already been done. So we want to deal with this for a moment. I think you and I both would agree this morning that God's grace is a mystery. I stand amazed at God's grace every time I think about it. His, he, and it's not just a great, it's amazing grace. Consider something for a moment in this passage. I'm going to stay right there, but I'm, I'm going to drop back one. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1 for a moment. It's a few things I discovered about God's grace. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse number 4. We can start at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. He's blessed first, but who's blessed us? With all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According to as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He grace because of the unmerited gift of God, because of what he's given us, not based upon our works. He did this in eternity past. He didn't wait till you and I got here. Before anybody, before there was a win or a world, then or there, he had already established how we would be in his sight. Holy and without blame. He did this in eternity past. He didn't consult us about anything at all. Let me tell you what he did. He did three things in eternity past. He established the method. If you write stuff down. He established the man and he established the message. In eternity past. The message was going to be through the gospel. That's the message. He established that message in eternity past. That everybody must do what? He said, you're going to have faith. Faith coming by hearing. Hearing by what? Hearing by the word of God. You got to hear the word of God to have faith in God. And the hearing, you must hear what? The gospel. That's what he said. That's the message. And then he said, I established the man. Oh, Lord, have mercy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only what? Beloved son. Who is that beloved son? Jesus Christ. That's the man. No man cometh unto the Father except he come by who? By Christ. Is that right? You can talk back to me, y'all. We at home now. We at home now. We ain't slayed anybody. I'm going to be no more. You can talk back to me now. The idea of the fact that through Christ Jesus, he says here, all my spiritual blessings come through him. So he is the man. So I got the message and I got the man. And in that message, I heard a thing about hearing, believing, and repenting. What's the method? All must repent and be what? They asked the question in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. said, Lord, what shall we do? He told them to do what? Repent and be what? Baptized. He go to method. Go to method. You must be, you must. John chapter 3. Nicodemus came to Christ by night. And what did he tell him? You must be born again. That's the method. He established all three of those in eternity past. And if you got a problem with any one of those three today, you got a problem with God. Because God did it before you got here. That's when he did it. The spiritual blessings were established in eternity past. Grace has determined that we will be like him, like Jesus, and with Jesus one day. Ephesians 1 verse 5 said, having predestinated us, that means that he foreordained us. Who's us? Those that will obey the gospel. It's not Jerry Lewis, no, no. It's us who are obedient to the gospel. He had foreordained us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Mm. Oh, 
Where would we be without God's grace? What would we be doing without God's grace? Everything we possess as believers is ours. Through and by the grace of God, through faith. Where are you getting there, Brother Cameron? I think sometimes we have to go back and learn to appreciate what we have and what it costs somebody to give us what we have to make us live better. To make us appreciate about what's going on in our life. My son came down here. I said, well, y'all going somewhere? Him and his wife, he said, yeah. I said, well, why don't y'all leave the, y'all car here and go ahead and drive my truck. And, you know, go have a good time. Came back. The dad said, yeah. He said, oh, man. Why have I not liked that truck? I said, oh, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, uh, Bluetooth? He said, oh, yeah, man. I said, when you sit inside of it, the seat automatically adjusts to you. He said, oh, yeah. I said, all them lights inside, running lights inside. He said, oh, yeah. I said, big, comfortable seats. He said, oh, yeah, you can lay back and go to sleep in them. I said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, speakers everywhere. He said, oh, yeah. Big tire. Said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, when you roll the windows up, you can't hear nothing outside. I said, it's bad, ain't it? He said, oh, that's a bad truck, Dad. Yeah, but it's my truck. <laughs> it's my truck. He said, yeah, I know. He said, but I want one like it. We ought to live our lives so other folk will want to be part, want to be a vessel like you are for Christ. We ought to live our lives in mind that we ought to be able to influence people with the way we live and not just with our stuff. I don't want to make the wrong impression going to Brooklyn with bragging about his truck. I'm not bragging about my truck. I just like it, that's all. <laughs> but what I'm getting at here is this. We did not and we could not earn nothing we have received by grace through faith on our own. You hear me? We deserve nothing we have received. We purchased nothing that we have. And everything we have in Jesus Christ has been given to us by the grace of the almighty God. Amen. Never once can I brag about myself. I got to remember, it's, it's all by the grace of God. But listen, he does not expect us to repay him for his grace. No, no, no. Why? Because I have nothing that I own that's equivalent, can equal up to what he's done for me. How can a sinful old me offer a justified God something that he's going to be satisfied with? It ain't going to happen. Look who I'm offering this thing to. I can't offer nothing to bring peace between me and him. He has offered. While God does not expect any return payments from us, he does expect a return on his investment. You are, we are an investment of God. And he expects a return on our investment. Don't you ever think about returning back to God what he's blessed you with the same way he gave it to you. You ought to make it better. He ought to be able to influence somebody's life. Mm. The work of grace in us results in some very real changes in our lives. These changes allow us to live for God. Our living for him according to his will brings glory to his name. Anybody got a problem with that? When your kids leave your house and go off to school, you be, hey, bring glory to my name. Don't you go out there acting like you're not mine. Or when you come back home, I'm going to treat you like you're not mine. See, we all understand the concept, but sometime in our lives, things kind of push us in the wrong direction. When grace comes to a lost, dead sinner, 
How do I know? How do I know it's this right here? How do I know that grace is supposed to change our lives? Because I recognize something. Every Christian has a past. And every sinner got a future. Did you hear me this morning? The, 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 the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, first it lets us know where you were at. He says, first of all, ye were without life. In Ephesians verse one, chapter 2, verse 1, he said, you had to quicken. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You were spiritually dead to God. Spiritually dead to God. You had a pulse. You was alive, but you were dead to God. What are you getting there, bro? Okay, I'm saying this right here. He said that you were shooting at the right target, or you had to aim at the right target, but you were shooting in the wrong direction. When you trespasses and sin. A trespass is, is, is when you fail to do what God said do. You trespass. When you should have stood up, you fail. You fell over. You sinned against him by violating his law. So you was dead. You couldn't do nothing to revive yourself. You couldn't make yourself stop. You ever recognize that on a good day? You said, tomorrow when I wake up, I'm not going to let so-and-so get me mad. And the first time you get up, you're in a rage by 9 a.m. So you done got your man already. With your best effort sometimes, you can't stop you from doing what you do. Uh, you were dead. You were dead. Not only were you without life, he said you were without strength. Verse 2 says you walk according to the course of this world. The course of this world has power and it has influence. You are carried away by the world's influences and like a dead fish in the stream without any power to resist or change directions. Let's take a look, y'all. There are many of us today. I know we're not talking about a lot. In the lowest church. Who the world has gotten a hold of them. Come on, church. See, y'all got quiet on them. And they have pulled them back out into the world. They have suffered at the hand of sin so great. Sin has tore them up back, has brought them down, has put them in some places, have counted some people they never would have inquired or never would have encountered before had it not been for sin. And now, guess what? The Lord allowed them to go through it because that's his chastisement, but then they get out of it and they return right back to it again. That is a, 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 a phenomenon that we have yet to understand. That's just the power of sin. That's why he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Look at here. Yeah, I figured out something, you know. If I got a good old car and I wanted to, I wanted to restore that car, I got to go back to the place where the car was built at. I got to go back and find the original parts that go in that car. Uh, I, I, I believe in right blood parts in order to restore that car. Because then it's called a complete restoration. I kept the original parts because that's when the car performed at its best. And that's what I want. Too often, when we come to restore ourselves or each other in the body of Christ, we go to another blueprint. Another blueprint other than the word of God. And you think the idea that your restoration is going to be good? No, it's not. Because in order to get you back to what you ought to be, I got to go to the one that built you in the first place. I got to go back to the word of God. It's in the word of God I find out where every piece is supposed to be in. And when I restore it back to the body of Christ, all that other gunk in the engine, 
all them other parts that came from people out in the world who don't know nothing about the word of God, all that is taken out and the original is put in. And when the original is put in there, guess what? You can't put any kind of gas in there. Only one type of oil to go in there. But what happens is, is over time, in our restoration, we don't stay consistent in it. And we find ourselves being led astray all back over again, being pulled back out there. And I got to say it this morning. Can we talk this morning, church? Then the church becomes the official Santa Claus. Can I say that is there only when I need? And after I obtain, I go do what I want to do. But where is the commitment to Christ? Where is the where, where, where is the persistence in my living a life of devotion to Christ? And then when I get out there and I get overwhelmed, I get drowned by life circumstances, what do I do? Oh, South Park, help me. Church, help me. Don't y'all care about me no more? No, no, no. Do you care about you? Do you care about your soul? Do you care? Because I can care all night, 24 hours, seven days a week. But if you don't care, everything I put in is going to go right back out. I'm just saying somebody got to say something. You were without. You were without Christ. You were without. He even goes on to tell you, not only were you without Christ, were you without strength, were you without life, he even told you in verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 2, he said at time past, you were without Christ, you were even aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having, you had no hope without God, and you was in this world. What's all in this world, church? The lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He even said the idea in chapter 2, when you read it in chapter 2, verse 2 of Ephesians, he said, we're in time past. You walked according to the course of this world. Watch this. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's where we was at. We were so far out. But now, now, I'm, I'm coming down to the call. I'm, I'm, I got to give it to you. In bits and bits. It's too much to give you at one time. I got to give it to you like mama gave us castor oil. She snuck it to you on the side. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. But one time we were without, without God in the world. But he quickened us together in Christ Jesus. And because he's done this in Christ, now 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, verse 16 says, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, like we don't know Christ after the flesh, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Watch the verses. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. Now he's going to tell you what all things are. Verse 18, and all things are of God. Why God? Because he's the one who has done what? Reconciled us to himself by who? Jesus Christ. And not only he reconciled us, but he gave us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Oh, look what he's done for us. Look what he's done for us. The old appetites and ways of living are laid aside for a brand new life in Jesus. What God works in us by his grace will work its way out in our lives. See, because of our past, he got to work some stuff out of us. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Y'all know we got some stuff in us. Y'all know we got some residual still in us. Y'all know some stuff we still working on in us. 
the same way he got you out of the world, now he got to work on the stuff in you. And while he work on the stuff in you, he got to get that stuff out of you. So you can be what? A vessel he needs you to be in this world. Come remember what he's doing now. He called you out of the world to change you. But then when he does that the world, he sends you right back out into the world to change somebody else, to influence somebody else. Ain't that amazing? And not only are we saved by his grace, we are changed by grace through faith. As the grace of God works itself out in our lives, it manifests itself in us through our works. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. Because next, we got to go into this workmanship of, of how, how we define it and what it teaches us. If you got a pen, just write down Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through verse 14. Take a look at that when you go home. But now we got to talk about workmanship. Is what he has worked out in us. Because honestly, honestly, if the world wants to know what a strong marriage is, they all look at us. Yes, do. It don't matter if my sister, you're a Christian, husband's not. Or husband, you're a Christian. Wife is not. What you mean, brother Kimmons? Because if he loves you, he loves the one who represented in your life. And if Christ is represented in your life, he don't realize he's falling in love with Christ because he's falling in love with you. He's not going to prevent you, stop you, hinder you in any shape, form, or fashion because of the way you are presenting a, 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 a woman of God in your home. Same way for the man. She's not going to stop you because you're respecting her, you're loving her, you're providing for her, and you're showing the idea because of my connection with God that's keeping me at home with you. No matter what we go through, I love you and I love my God. As long as you don't ask me to defy my God, I, I'll stand by your side. See, we need more of that. They want to know how, how to raise children up right. I didn't say they're going to always turn out right, but how to raise them up right, they ought to be able to come to us for those, 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 those questions. They ought to be able to. Too many of us are still hooked up in self and not Christ. Too many of us weigh in on what we have and what we don't want to give up. Christ gave up everything for us. And we're trying to hang on. What you hanging on for? Oh, Lord, if I could just talk this morning. But I, I can't. I can't. I can't. But the idea is that we are his workmanship. We show proof of everything he did for us to make us who we are. To change us from what we was to what we are right now. He said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Ask you a question today before I close. Are you living the abundant life? Or are you just living? I told you I watch a lot of little TV shows. Not really TV shows, but I watch a lot of little, little kids movies sometimes. And if you ever watch the movie The Crudes, little cave people, every time something happened, they always ran back into a cave in darkness. Then one day, they was out there, met a new person. Daughter fell in love with some new guy on the planet called Guy. Anyway, so finally out there, and the volcano started erupting, and the earth started cracking. And he said, we got to find a cave, got to find a cave, got to find a cave. And his daughter told him, said, no, 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 no more caves. No more caves, no more darkness. He said, we've always, he said, no, you know. He said, that's how we survive. He said, no. She said, no, dad, no, dad. 
She said, that wasn't living, they were just not dying. A whole lot of us uh, think that we're living, we're just not dying. Haven't learned to fully trust in the Lord just yet. But I challenge you this morning with that statement, if we go on further as the Lord's will, if we go, <coughs> we are his workmanship. What do you look like? What matter of man is he who beholdeth himself in the mirror and walk away and forget what manner of man he is? Let's break it down even further. What manner of man is he who beholdeth himself by the word of God and the word of God makes you see what you really are and as you put that Bible down and walk away out like there ain't nothing wrong with you? Just all stuck out pushing your hair all back like you working on 100. No. No. He said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Ye are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which he foreordained even before the world was created. If you're here this morning and you're not a member of the Lord's church. You can be a member this morning of the Lord's church. You can come while we stand and sing the invitation of song. Come hearing, believing, repenting, confessing. Then raise and submit to him in water baptism for remission of your sins. That you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord asks you as church those who are being saved. Be thou faithful unto death. Even in dying, be thou faithful. And the Lord will give you a crown of life that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven just for you. Then you can become his workmanship. Come right now as we stand and sing and we taste the song. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this morning. Because 